Class 11 deals with the reforms of the Council of Trent and secular influences uh, that we begin to see in the Renaissance period. Some of the reforms of the Council of Trent uh, showed vitality uh, in the church, but those um, reforms were short-lived. The church faced challenges on many fronts. The Enlightenment, uh, or the Age of Reason, uh, was advocated as the primary source of legitimacy and authority. Now, today that may seem, um, you know, like a common fact. However, at the time, that challenged the church's own authority as the final arbiter of what was right and wrong, or historical or not historical, or scientific or not unscientific. Uh, it's a movement of science and reason, uh, the Enlightenment. There are significant scientific advances, uh, like the idea of heliocentricity. Uh, it threatened the ideological structure of the church. Um, the philosophy of crit critical rationalism tore at the heart of tradition, as a key element of divine revelation. See, for the Catholics, um, it's not just the Bible that is the source of revelation from God. Uh, the Bible is one source, but tradition with a capital T. That means the teachings that have come down from, um, after the Bible was written, uh, teachings of the Pope, teachings of the bishops, uh, teachings of ecumenical councils, those are considered part of the capital T tradition of the church. And so that's important to realize that uh, the critical rationalism kind of tears at the heart of that. Um, religious freedom was threatened. Uh, it was this idea that you could not just be Catholic, you could also follow uh, Luther or you could follow Calvin. It threatened the church's idea that unity was essential for social order and salvation. Um, and it's kind of interesting, you know, having been in Salt Lake City uh, this fall and, you know, being around a somewhat uh, monolithic uh, population where, you know, many, many, many people are Mormons was uh, kind of an interesting experience for me. Um, and so that idea of religious freedom, uh, you know, when Salt Lake City was founded by uh, Brigham Young, and the other Mormons that came across from Missouri, uh, they saw this as their as their Zion. This is where they would build their their kind of utopian society where everyone was Mormon. Of course, that never really was the case. There were always uh, other faiths there, uh, but you can see how in Europe, especially within the Catholic Church, that most people were Roman Catholic, and the idea that. Now you could choose which way you thought was more, you know, valid for you. And all, in all honesty, it usually wasn't that. It was kind of the, the ruler, the king, the prince, the duke, uh, you know, kind of determined that for the people. And people were becoming more wealthy uh, at this time as well. And more wealth produced more secularism and materialism. We see the results of that today. And so therefore... A wider gulf is being developed between culture and the church. Today, that gulf is a humongous chasm in 2016. <clears throat> but at the time, there was uh, this was you know beginning to develop and beginning beginning to widen uh, within the the church and the culture. So we come to this new era of music in which. The prima pratica, um, which is where music dominated over the text. And then we come to the seconda pratica, where the text dominated over the music. If you think of the prima pratica, like composers uh, like Josquin and Palestrina and Bird, the text was absolutely important, but it was not the final arbiter of how things um should be written. It was the music that was the most important thing. But with this Conta Pratica, which uh, begins the Baroque era, it is the text which dominates over the music. It determines the music. And this is a very important thing to keep in mind. So the second uh, 
practice, this new practice, is where the, the text dominates over the music. And we call this Seconda Pratica period the Baroque era. The Baroque era uh, emphasizes uh, the vocal and textual expression, which led to accompanied monody. Monody uh, is similar to monophony. However, monody is like a song with a voice, one solo line, and accompaniment. So it's a vocal style that's distinguished by having that melodic line and an instrumental accompaniment. It's most of the music that we have today is a type of monody. And so it's related to monophony uh, in that uh, there's one solo line or one vocal line, um, but in monophony there is no accompanying accompaniment to that. Uh, monody assumes the presence of a bass line for, harmo for a harmonic framework with the other instruments filling in the harmonies, in what we call a basso continuo. I'm going to give you an example here. It's an excerpt from Henry Purcell's opera called Dido and Aeneas. And this is a song called Thy Hand, Belinda. And here in this music you see the top line is the solo vocal line. And it's accompanied by the bottom line, which is what we call the basso continuo. Now in this music here, you'll see that um, the basso line, the bass line, has these long held notes, kind of similar to what we had before with organum. However, it's now it's different, so that's to be played on an instrument. And you'll see below the musical staff, you'll see little numbers written in, or little symbols. So in that first note, where you have the that C whole note, you see a flat below that. And then the next note, in the next measure, you see a flat 7. And uh, the other one, I can't see it because it's a little small on my screen. But you see those little symbols below that. That's what we call a figured bass line. And this figured bass line, those little numbers and symbols below the bass line, will tell the other instrumentalists what note to play. So the basso line, that one long note, is usually played by a cello, or it could be played by a bassoon, or something, or some similar instrument. And then the other instruments around that might be a harpsichord, which would fill in the harmonies around that, uh, or it could be a guitar-like instrument, the chitarone or the fiorbo, um, any number of instruments that would kind of fill in the harmonic structure around that, and those numbers below that would help determine the sound of that. So let's take a listen to this uh, song. This is Monody, um, and it's called Thy Hand Belinda. It's from Purcell's Dido and Aeneas. Try that again. This is the kind of new music that we get in the Baroque era. So that's the basso continuo, continuo line there. Let's take a look at what that looks like 
uh, with those other notes filled in. So here, if you take a look at <clears throat> the larger notes that are on the bottom, <clears throat> that would be the basso line. And then you see those figurations below that. When there's no figuration, that face line indicates a certain kind of har harmony. E so even when there's no number below that, it still indicates the, the actual harmony. And so those smaller notes that you see above the basso line is essentially what the chord would be like. And that's kind of the notes that the other instruments would be playing. Uh, this idea of basso continuo is so important to virtually all Baroque music. The bass line with accompanying numbers or figures, sometimes we call it a figured bass, shows the choral structure or the harmonic structure. And this uh, example of a figured bass line is taken from a piece by Johann Sebastian Bach, who's probably the greatest composer of the Baroque era. So these now accompanying instruments are integral to, um, to music. Counterpoint was infused with Baroque, the Baroque concept of harmonically based melody. Counterpoint was driven by harmony now. Even in imitative counterpoint, the individual melodic lines were subordinated to a succession of chords. This is an important contrast to earlier periods. The melodic lines were conceived linearly, and the resulting harmony was a natural result. That's what we had before uh, with those earliest composers of uh, polyphony, where melodic lines were conceived as lines, and the result of putting two lines or three lines or four lines together created a harmony. But now the harmony is a controlling force. So imitative counterpoint in the Baroque period, um, those individual lines are now subordinated to a succession of chords. So that's important to, um, to, to realize at this, at this point in music history. Before it was the individual melodies creating the harmony. Here now we have the succession of various chords which are determining the music. So it's the end of the mode for you. The Seconda Pratica gives us so much tone color and chromatics. You heard it in that short excerpt from Dido and Aeneas by Hand Belinda. So many chromaticisms in that, in the, in the basso line, but also in the vocal line. Um, and this kind of allows for more emotional sentiment to be expressed. And this is a driving force within Baroque music, the idea of the expression of emotion. <clears throat> we'll see how in these various musical periods there is this swing between emotionalism or intellectualism. And so for the Baroque period, it's emotional sentiments which are very important. And this idea, this there's a kind of medieval idea, um, medically speaking, that's known as the theory of humors that each human body, each person, had four basic substances in their body. And those four substances had to be kept in balance. It kept a person healthy. So there was blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. And medically, they believed that those four things should be in balance. And if they weren't, then you were sick. And so that whole idea of the theory of humors uh, is important uh, musically as well because uh, that idea of balance is so important. And so in Baroque music, you'll see more contrasts. Uh, so there's contrasts which can be a solo part versus a whole ensemble part that you might have in one piece, or a high section and a low section, or loud and soft. Uh, and this gives rise to <clears throat> the concertato, um, or this idea of fighting back and forth between solo and ensemble, high and low, loud and soft. Uh, and this is developed within the Baroque period. Opera is a natural outgrowth 
uh, of this emphasis on expression of emotion. And the oratorio is kind of a religious equivalent of opera. I don't know if any of you have seen an opera before, um, uh, but we'll discuss a little bit more of opera. But opera has an oratorios and uh, the cantatas and, uh, and such. They have a similar uh, structure in where you have an orchestra playing and a soloist singing or a chorus singing. Uh, and they're telling a story. So opera is about story. Oratorio is about story. Oratorios had, were opera's religious equivalent, and so they told biblical stories. Um, so you have a story of creation, like Haydn's oratorio called The Creation. Or you would have something which many of you might have heard. Uh, George Friedrich Handel, his... Uh, Messiah oratorio, which told the life of Jesus. And uh, from that we have the Hallelujah Chorus, which I'm sure many of you have heard, even though you might not be able to think of it now. That's the one that goes, Hallelujah, 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 Hallelujah. <laughs> okay, I messed it up at the end, but you get the idea. So many of these composers were writing oratorios, which had a... Uh, religious component to them, and sometimes they were writing operas as well. So often these oratorios took biblical texts or liturgical texts to tell the story, um, but they were not designed for the church primarily. They were designed for the concert hall. So let's talk about opera, because this is an important outgrowth uh, in the Baroque period. Even though this class is about the Mass and its music, it's important to know at this point what is going on because opera has uh, a very important influence on the ma music of the Mass. The Florentine Camerata was a group of intellectual poets and musicians and politicians, and they, it comes to rise around the end of the Renaissance period and of the many things that were discussed among the camarada, these poets and intellectuals and politicians and musicians, one was an attempt to recreate Greek drama. Because we know in the Renaissance, there was a huge uh, interest now in Greek literature, Greek plays, and so they tried to recreate the way the Greeks must have done their theater which was through some kind of singing, but then, of course, there's no recording, so they tried to recreate that. And so the poets and musicians uh, wanted to figure out a way to do that, a way they must have done that. And so they come up with this thing, these uh, people in the Florentine Camerata, they come up with this, what's called the Stile Rappresentativo, or what we would translate in English uh, as the dramatic style. Uh, literally, it is the this, this style representative. Um, so it's trying to represent the music, or the, trying to represent, the music is trying to represent the text which is being sung in a very literal way. And so one of the first great composers of this new uh, form that the, the, um, Camerata helps to develop is a man named Claudio Monteverdi. And you see his life um, from 1567 to 1643. The Baroque period begins, we, 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 we say the Baroque period begins at 1600. So if you think, if you look at his lifespan, his lifespan spans both the Renaissance period and the beginning of the Baroque period. So if you listen to Monteverdi's uh, works, um, the music written around 1600 is very Renaissance-like. But by the end of his life, it's much more in the Baroque style. So he is a transitional figure in music history between the Renaissance and the Baroque. So he was a composer, and he, he was a composer of opera as well as many other things. And so uh, 
as the composer of the music or the score, as we say. And as I mentioned, he is a transitional figure. <clears throat> he writes the first great opera that we have, and that is called L'Orfeo, or Orpheus. He writes it in 1607, and he writes it for <coughs> a special occasion. Take a drink of water. He writes it for the wedding of uh, the Duke of Mantua, so where, kind of where he was living at the time, near Florence. He writes it for the wedding, this wedding, and uh, the story is of Orpheus, uh, who, as you might remember, I, I talked about this one treatise, and the, the I think it was the 19th chapter of the treatise dealt with the myth of Orpheus, who is kind of like the... Um, <laughs> the uh, example for musicians. So Orpheus was the, um, the son of Apollo and the muse Calliope. And he, his wife uh, is bitten by a serpent and died on their wedding day. And Orpheus, with true love, goes to retrieve her from the underworld. So it's kind of a sad story, but it's uh, I think it was written for the wedding and has been a theme for musicians because it shows this kind of passion uh, that Orpheus had and this dedication that he had to his wife. Um, the man who wrote the libretto, or the words, the story, his name was Alessandro Strigio. So he writes what we call the book or the lyrics. Um, we're not going to take a look at this because I've asked you to watch this video of Orpheus and that scene where um, the messenger comes in and announces the death of Orpheus. So uh, if you haven't looked at that yet, make sure you do. And you'll be answering these questions. So how does the music represent the action and the emotion? And notice the varied emotions that are going on in here. How is the monody in the example different from monophony or polyphony? So as I describe monody, uh, you should hear the difference between monophony and polyphony. Um, if you don't, I want you to, to keep listening to that. And finally, how does the theory of humors influence the style of drama or acting in the example? And you'll submit those on Moodle. Uh, this piece is an example of monody, Lasciate mi morire, and it's a solo line. I don't know if you'll be able to hear me sing but uh, with the music, but let's give it a shot. Lasciate mi morire sung that for another class, uh, but that should give you an example of monody. That is a piece by Claudio Monteverdi, but it is not from Orfeo. You can hear the chromaticism in that piece. Um, unfortunately, you hear my, <laughs> my unwarmed up voice, uh, but it gives you uh, kind of a, an example of that. So that's it for lecture number 11. Thanks.